ABC Sports presents the most prestigious auto racing event in America, the Indianapolis 500. How fast is fast at Indianapolis? Well, in 1911, fast was 74 miles an hour, the average speed of Ray Haroon's winning car. But 74 years later, fast is 212 miles per hour, the four-lap average of Pancho Carter as he qualifies. Pancho Carter, winner of the pole position at age 34, has finished in the top 10 here six times. His father finished fourth 33 years ago. Pancho won the pole with a Buick V6 engine, and a Buick won the second spot, too. 26-year-old Scott Brayton came here sponsored only by his family's finances, but picked up more sponsors when the speed of his car became apparent. With his talent and good looks, he has to be Coldwater, Michigan's most eligible bachelor. On the outside of the first row, you'll see this car driven by 32-year-old Bobby Rahal of Dublin, Ohio, just outside Columbus. Rahal finished seventh last year. He's an intelligent, articulate college graduate who looked as at home in his dinner clothes the night before last at a charity ball as he does in his flame-proof coveralls behind the wheel of his race car. That, then, is the first row. This is Mario Andretti with his baby son, Michael, not so many years ago. Today, father and son are competitors. Mario, the free race favorite, starting on the inside of row two at age 45. This is Mario's 20th start here. He won just once, 16 years ago. Another father and son also face off as adversaries here. The Al Unser, senior and junior of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Al Sr. is a three-time winner. His brother Bobby also won the great race three times. And now comes the next generation. The face behind that mask is still the face of a kid, although Al Jr. is a 23-year-old husband and father. There's a brother act in this year's race, Don and Bill Whittington of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Don, the elder by three years, seems to have the better chance. He inherited the car of former winner Gordon Johncock when Johncock suddenly retired. Don Whittington will sit on the outside of row two. Rick Mears is the defending champion, but will have to move up from 10th starting position. At age 33, he has already won the 500 twice. Unlike most drivers, Rick found his road to the top in sprint buggies and off-road racing. It was a rugged introduction to the sport. Since then, he has found that there are good days and bad. Good days, like the celebration after last year's victory, but bad days too. Later last season, his feet were crushed in an accident. He spent painful months in the hospital and today will limp to the car in his first race of 1985. Tom Sneva, too, knows about good days and bad. Three times he has sat on the pole. Two years ago, he won the race. But in 1975, this was the end of his day. A wild, terrifying crash just under the luxury suites in turn two. A crash from which, miraculously, he emerged with minor injuries. Now at age 36, Tom Sneva tries again. He has traveled a long way from his original profession of school teacher, a long way from the halls of Ivy to the walls of Indy. Daniel John Sullivan III was born in Louisville 35 years ago, a talented driver, but is better known as the bon vivant of the circuit, more in the mold of the glamorous Grand Prix drivers of another time than the computer-driven technicians of today. And then there is A.J., A.J. Foyt, the epitome of everything that is Indy, the only four-time winner of the race competing for the 28th time at age 50. This was his wildest win, A.J. threading his way through wrecked cars and smoke on the final turn of the final lap, a breathtaking moment, but A.J. made it. Dwight Eisenhower was president when A.J. first came here. He endured, driver, chief mechanic, a jack of all racing trades in an era of specialization. A three-time winner just made it to the 10th row this year. Johnny Rutherford, Lone Star JR, had to bump the slowest car in the final hour of qualifying last Sunday to make the race. Old champs versus young, brother against brother, father against son in the world's most famous motor race. ABC Sports presents the Indianapolis 500. This is Jim McKay reporting live from the start-finish line at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's 8 o'clock in the evening here. The tumult and the shouting have long since died after today's running of the Indianapolis 500. The 400,000 or so people who are here have taken their memories home with them. All 270,000 permanent seats here are empty. There's nobody left, but we have ABC Sports and the people undertaking the thankless job of cleaning up. It's a very quiet place. Certainly not so, shortly before 11 o'clock this morning. 
You know, the month of May is always special for me. It begins with the Kentucky Derby and ends with the Indianapolis 500. They're two of the world's greatest one-day sporting events. They take place within 100 miles of each other, and they're uniquely American. Midwest patriotic, heralding the coming of the good old summertime. And each begins with a song. Not a military march or a college fight song, but a song of longing for home. In Louisville, it's my old Kentucky home. And here in Indianapolis, back home again in Indiana. Ladies and gentlemen, singing back home again in Indiana are the Voices of Liberty from Walt Disney World. And they are being conducted by none other than Mickey Mouse, the Grand Marshal of the 1985 Indianapolis 500 Festival Parade. This is Tom Carnegie switching you. The pageantry's been going on for almost three hours now. To College bands and movie stars and Mickey Where Mouse now? and old race cars on parade. But all that is mere prelude to the race itself. 33 drivers soon will hear the command to start their engines and the race will begin. One is named Danny Sullivan and Sam Posey, my colleague in commentary here, is in communication with him as Danny sits in his car. Danny, this is Sam Posey. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Sam. Turn your volume down just a little bit, but everything's going great. This is an unbelievable spectacle. In the warm-up laps before the start, in the next few minutes, what are the things you'll be looking for? Looking for the wind, see how dirty the track is, uh, just make sure everything's warming up okay, and just start my train of thought about what we're going to do at the start. Thank you, and good luck. Americans are not given to brevity, but there are a few short sentences that we first hear as children and react to with excitement all our lives. The brief statements are, play ball, they're off, and gentlemen, start your engines. The command about to be given by Mrs. Mary Holman, the widow of the man who made the Speedway what it is today. Gentlemen, start your engines. Now the first thing we wonder is, did they all get started? We can't really be sure until they begin to move out. But this is the moment when there's no turning back. Now the commitment is made to parade your car before 400,000 spectators on the scene, then to accelerate on the pace lap, watch for the green flag from the starter, and then to race for riches and glory. There's Dwayne Pancho Carter, the pole sitter, trying to do what his father could not do before him to win an Indy. Next to him, young Scott Brayton, another race driver's son. They say they're old drivers and bold drivers, but no old vile drivers. Well, Scott Brayton is young, 26. Bobby Rahal rounding out the first row, a thinking man's driver, not the instinctive natural athlete. None of these three, remember, has ever started on the front row before. There's 
Mario Andretti, the favorite at age 45, 16 years after his only victory in the 500. He's right behind Carter, the pole sitter. 